Now, between the forts, the Belgians have quickly put some infantry, and there are a couple machine guns around and whatnot, and the Germans, you know, they're in a bit of a rush here. They don't have time to sit there and starve things out. This 30,000-man force with artillery has to go in there and power this through so that the armies behind them can continue their, you know, huge assault through Belgium on France, and they charge these, you know, entrenchments, and the Belgians slaughter them. Slaughter them. Mounds of bodies, and the Belgians can't figure out the best way to deal with it because the mounds of bodies become a problem. Because the mounds of bodies become places German troops can hide behind and shoot from behind and launch attacks from behind. And the Belgians are trying to figure out, okay, do we shoot through these bodies and create, can you, can you create a hole through bodies if you shoot through them with a machine gun long enough? Or do we send out people to risk their lives to create holes in the bodies that we can shoot through? Barbara Tuckman, she now quotes a Belgian officer who was there, quote, they made no attempt at deploying, a Belgian officer described it later, but came on line after line, almost shoulder to shoulder, until we shot them down. The fallen were heaped on top of each other in an awful barricade of dead and wounded that threatened to mask our guns and cause us trouble. So high did the barricade become that we didn't know whether to fire through it or to go out and clear openings with our hands. But would you believe it? This veritable wall of dead and dying enabled those wonderful Germans to creep closer and actually charge up the embankment. They got no farther than halfway, though, because our machine guns and rifles swept them back. Of course, we had our losses, but they were slight compared to the carnage we inflicted on our enemies. End quote. It's interesting to note, isn't it, that Belgian officer's respect for those wonderful Germans, as he called them, exhibiting the military virtues of valor that were so celebrated during this period where the romance of warfare, you know, which had always been strong in human culture, was probably at its height. The 19th century, the romance was incredible. This is the era where that romance runs into reality in a way that you just can't pretend. I mean, guys like, you know, William Tecumseh Sherman, the Civil War general for the U.S., famously said that war is hell and its glory is all moonshine. But that didn't really seep into the mass of the population. As one historian had pointed out, they weren't publishing a whole lot of combat photos and really nasty, terrible stuff for the folks back home at any time during these periods. So there wasn't a lot of stuff to really counteract the romantic ideas of war. This is the conflict where you can't hide it anymore. And even though this Belgian officer looks at this German assault on his fort as something akin to the charge of the Light Brigade, the famous doomed charge of that British cavalry during the Crimean War. But here's the thing that this war is going to teach. If you watch the charge of the Light Brigade and you think it's magnificent and, and brave, a doomed sort of attack on the part of incredibly you know, courageous men, what happens if after the charge fails... They send another one, and the same results occur. And then they send another one, and the same results occur. And then they do it again and again. At what point does this wonderful, doomed, romantic, you know, celebration of the courage of the military heart become something obscene? 